Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, double inaugural for two of uh, the university's Humanitas uh, chairs. Um, let me start by saying a word about the Humanitas program. Um, it's a series of visiting professorships, uh, both to Oxford uh, and to another university, uh, intent, that's a silly joke, to Cambridge, intended to bring um, leading practitioners and scholars uh, to both those ancient seats of learning to address uh, major themes in the arts, the social sciences, and the humanities. It's now been running for a few years, and it's already making uh, a really great contribution to the intellectual life of both those institutions. It was created by Lord Weidenfeld. Uh, the program was managed and is funded by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in uh, collaboration with a number of very generous benefactors. And in Oxford, it's administered by the Humanities Division. Uh, the two Humanitas chairs that we have today are the uh, Chair in Contemporary Art, which is made possible by the great imaginative philanthropy of Ivory Press, and the Chair in Museums, Galleries and Libraries, which is made possible by the tremendous benefaction and generosity of Foster and Partners. So I begin by acknowledging those great acts of philanthropy and thanking those donors and those uh, inspirations on behalf of us all and on behalf of the University of Oxford. So we're here to talk about creativity and about curatorship, which might seem very different sorts of human activity, but it's always seemed to us that they're very closely related kinds of human activity, which is why these two chairs have always been, so far in their history, paired off uh, one with another in joint events. Uh, you haven't come to listen to me, but being an Oxford Don, I can't resist telling you one anecdote. Um, my favourite anecdote about a curator. I can't claim I have an enormous repertoire of anecdotes about curators. But my favourite one is about Kenneth Clark, Lord Clark of Civilization, who was, as you will all remember, or will all know at least, curator of the National Gallery in London for many years. And in one of his autobiographical writings, Kenneth Clark remembers uh, stealing into the galleries long before opening time, and looking at one of the great canvases, which, as I remember, is a canvas by Velazquez. What he does in front of this canvas, in the silence of the empty gallery, is to move slowly to and fro, looking at what's in front of him, and trying to find the precise point, the precise distance away from the painting, where uh, an abstract arrangement of pigments and paint suddenly modulates into a recognizable human scene with an implied human story. Uh, and I like to think of him at 6.30 in the morning, or whatever it is, uh, hovering around trying to find this precise spot where, uh, where the materials of art somehow magically come together to create an artwork. Um, it happens very vividly for realist painters like Velasquez, but it also would happen for any kind of art, abstract art, film, my own field, poetry. It's a lovely story. I like it for many reasons. Um, I like it partly because it shows the wonderful inwardness that a great curator can have with the works of art that he hangs upon his, or she hangs upon her walls, that something about the intimacy of life with these works of art gains a special kind of inwardness with their powers and their textures and, and uh, ambiguities. I like it also because of all sorts of questions it raises, some of which I think we're going to touch on in our lectures today. Uh, it's great uh, that Clark was having these extraordinary, valuable experiences, but there's an irony involved in the fact that they were solitary experiences before the doors opened. Uh, Clark was, of course, a fantastically successful curator who established the National Gallery uh, at the very heart of a national culture. Uh, and so there's a kind of a tension involved which is interesting and worth exploring between the solitariness which makes his own experience so valuable in recollection and the institutional nature of the occasion or, or the institution in which uh, it took place. And thirdly, it seems to me that in its own way, uh, this little episode shows the sort of juggle all the, 
or the tensions between something very private about the way that we value artworks, but also something very public about the way in which artworks are kept and preserved and cherished. Uh, this is a private experience, but happening in a massive public institution. And that sort of brings together many of the uh, intensely private creative decisions, but also the public sorts of context in which those decisions are taken, which must characterize any artwork, but perhaps especially artworks that grow against a background of conflict and civil strife uh, and historical trauma. So it's in the belief that these apparently different disciplines of curatorship and creativity actually have a very rich overlap and therefore a very rich kind of dialogue that we are delighted to have with us today uh, the incumbents of these two chairs. Uh, the uh, Humanitas Professorship of Contemporary Art, which is based at Magdalen and uh, looked after by my colleagues Christine Ferdinand and Paul Bonaventura, and the Humanities Professor for Museums, Galleries and Libraries based at Balliol and looked after by me. My name is Seamus Perry. This year's Professor of Contemporary Art is William Kentridge, who is one of the most successful, preeminent, and internationally distinguished uh, Af uh, artists of uh, South Africa. He's a student of politics, of mime, of theater, whose works encompass TV, film, theatrical expression, and very much else as well. The diversity of the media in which he imagines is reflected in the diversity of venues in which his work has been exhibited, which include the Louvre, La Scala, both the Metropolitan Opera and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, there's a touring exhibition currently going around Britain under the auspices of the Hayward, uh, and he has also recently uh, appeared in Sao Paulo, the relevance of which will become immediately clear. In 2010, he received the Kyoto Prize in recognition of his contributions in the fields of art and philosophy. In 2011, he was elected an honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And uh, last year, he was the Charles Eliot Norton Lecturer at Harvard. Uh, and academic uh, prestige doesn't get much higher than that particular invitation. The director of the uh, um, gallery in San Paolo, uh, who curated that show, is uh, the, direct, the current professor, this year's professor of uh, museums, galleries, and libraries, Ivo Mosquito, who I'm d delighted also to welcome to the platform. He has a very long and distinguished career as a curator, not just in Brazil, but around the world, including the Brazilian Pavilion at the 48th Venice Biennale in 1999 and the 53rd in 2009. Between 96 and 2007, he was a professor at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College in New York. And as well as these uh, many distinctions, he is also a very widely published art critic uh, and theorist of the museum. Uh, I'm delighted and honored to welcome them both here to Oxford today. The running order will be, uh, first, William Kentridge, uh, and then uh, Ivo Mosquita, then we'll have some questions, and then uh, we'll go to the reception uh, next door where there'll be a chance to grill our two professors further over a glass of Chardonnay. But first, let me hand over to William Kentridge for our first lecture. There's always a difference between the clarity and explicitness of a lecture, that it will follow a clear line of argument from a beginning through a development to a conclusion, the difference between this clarity and the mess that lies behind this line that finally appears. It's a bit similar to the question that Freud poses in his uh, interpretation of dreams, where he poses the question unanswerable, whether in fact dream images appear to us concurrently, all the images at the same time, or consecutively. 
and whether the order we give to these different images when we describe the dream at the end, which comes out as a linear story, as a film that we can tell ourselves or others, whether this in fact is a kind of violent redistribution or reconstruction of what was in fact a very different series of thoughts. And one of the things I'm interested in looking at today is, as it were, the prehistory of the lecture itself, of what is the nature of those different thoughts and clashing of images and ideas which in one form or another through different acts of violence have to come to resemble the linear progression of thought we associate with the idea of a lecture. This turning of these dream thoughts into the manifest dream Freud refers to as the, the secondary revision, what we tell ourselves as we're waking up of the story as we try to remember it before it disappears into sleep. And I suppose what I'm doing is an attempt at an interpretation and a deconstruction of this secondary revision. So this notebook, which is sequentially ordered from page 1 to page 10, I'm starting at 1 and I'm going to the end, is very different from the two other notebooks which preceded it, which were full of a mass of different possible ideas of thoughts that could come together and which I then had to study in the days and weeks preceding our meeting here, trying to understand what it could have meant, what I could have meant when I wrote these inexplicable statements, which at the time were clear, but which lose their clarity a moment, a moment later. And in this, I want to use the studio and the idea of the studio as both the location for this taking of different fragments and constructing something from it, and also the model of what we do when we try to shift between different ideas that are around us to a clarity of a trajectory. Now, this, the title of this lecture comes from some months ago when I was asked to make up a title and didn't quite know, so I thought, well, I'd talk about what it was in the studio. Um, and at the time, it was fairly clear that it would be about the activities of the studio. And there were a couple of other phrases in the, in the book um, which acted as aid memoirs rather than as clear titles, to know these are things that should be spoken about when we were meeting. And then another couple of phrases that came on which at the time made a reference to something very specific, but which for the life of me I cannot begin to remember what... There must have been an article about people at CERN chasing a muon, but I've forgotten too much about muons to know what the connection was. And so what follows is a kind of reconstruction of what those ideas could have been. Those ideas were mainly established once when I was doing a walk along the beach at the south coast of South Africa in, the, in our summer holiday, and I had a long walk on the beach, and I thought I have to, by the end of the speech, know what I'm going to be saying in Oxford in four months' time. And I returned with great clarity, but I realized it's the kind of clarity you sometimes have in a dream also, where you wake up and you think, I've got this great idea, and you pull it into wakingness with you from deep sleep, and in the cold light of waking, it turns to ash. You realize what seemed like a really funny joke in a dream is really extremely stupid. What seemed like a brilliant collection, connection is very, very flat. But when I talked of a walking tour of the studio, one of the things I was referring to is very directly that, the physical activity of walking in a studio. And here I want to make a distinction between the walking I was doing on the beach and the kind of walking that happens in the studio, which of necessity is a circling, a circling of a space, going past the basin, past the drawing table, around the sofa, back to the drawing table, crossing back to the wall where the camera is, and literally circling and circling. And it is something which sometimes happens for an hour before the first mark is put on a sheet of paper. And the nature of this walk, it has on the one hand to do with a gathering of energy, of impulses that are hovering at the edge of the idea until there's a moment of energy and clarity and the first mark is made. 
So it's a kind of procrastination. It is a waiting. It is putting off the time when your piece of charcoal or ink has to hit the sheet of paper and the process begin. But it's what I would describe as a kind of necessary and being optimistic, a productive procrastination. There's something in that physical activity of the walk, of the walk in the studio for me. There's something about what it is to be falling and catching yourself, which is the activity of walking. The repetition of the weight changing from the left leg to the right leg and back that shakes one's brain. That allows ideas to emerge that for me never come if I'm simply sitting and waiting, in which case there's a deep neutral. The brain goes into a deep neutral and nothing will happen. And I'll sit for 10 minutes and I'll say to myself, you'll see, nothing's happening. Wait another 10 minutes, nothing will happen. So there's something about that walking. And in the studio, what there is also, which is not there on the beach, is a kind of peripheral vision. A peripheral vision to the traces of other projects which exist on the walls of the studio, sketches, half-begun projects, old projects, the remnants of old projects, phrases, newspaper cuttings, all the usual paraphernalia of studios. So you have the activity of walking, you have a kind of peripheral vision, and you would have what I would describe, which I think becomes an important category, and that is that of peripheral thinking. Those ideas that start to impinge and emerge in your head without being the focus and center of the chasing down of an idea. And one of the things that happens in the studio in the process of making, because it is fundamentally a physical activity of making marks, of erasing, of redrawing, of there always being a gap between your head and your thinking and the arm, and a kind of reliance on a motor memory of the hand for ideas to emerge as well as a direction from the brain, a kind of combination between those two controls and different unconscious memory that seems important. And it's not to say that the motor memory or the action of the hand is the same as one unconscious in dream work at all, but there is something about a different kind of intelligence or approach to understanding that comes in this physical activity of art making. And so what happens in the studio is what happens when one's writing any lecture or doing any, any work, but perhaps in the studio emblematically, is that the world comes into the studio in the form of images, ideas, thoughts, conversations, whatever the things are either physically on the wall, and those physical things on the wall, drawings and text standing in for ideas, the world comes into the studio and the studio becomes a place for it to be deconstructed, taken apart, and then re-put back together. And one thinks of the collage as a particularly 20th century artistic phenomenon, but in fact in its very nature of pasting together different fragments of the world and from that constructing a possibly coherent world, one understands it's a very central category, both for artistic activity and artistic activity as a metaphor for how we think in general. So this idea of taking the world in and Splitting it apart is one of the central activities in the studio. And perhaps to make this much more concrete, we can talk about one very simple way in which one takes the world as a single thing and splits it apart. If you think of the very simple activity of what it is making a drawing in the studio. So one thinks of the the paper up on the wall, and yourself as the artist looking at it, trying to feel out where the different moments of it could start, where a possible horizon is, when there's a kind of a half projection onto the sheet of paper of a possible drawing that could happen on it. Understanding that the drawing will be a conversation between what the paper gives and what yourself do. But very soon there comes a secondary split. And that is when you step back from being the artist as maker of the drawing and yourself as a viewer of that which you have made. When one steps back as if someone else had made the work and you can very clearly see that, no, in fact, the, the shoulder of the rhinoceros is in the wrong place. And 
who was the idiot drawing it that put it so low? You could see it a moment. It's wrong. You must shift it up. And that the whole length of it feels wrong. And you could do it. And you give yourself mentally a series of notes. So when you step back to make the drawing, you can go back and correct these things that you have, you have done. And there's a, there's a very real sense of split in the sense of the person viewing being all-knowing and the person actually doing the drawing being really dumb and stupid and not getting it right. And the frustration that the one cannot be more sympathetic and attuned to what the other shows him. I mean, if you could just look and see, you can see that you need to lift the tail. The belly, the belly's in the wrong place. You can get that up. But it's not so hard to draw a rhinoceros. What is the struggle to do this? It's a simple thing. He's done it many times before. You can go it up. We should remember we've also got the dentist the next day, the things that have to be kept in one's head. And in fact, he has, he has many useful books. There are many useful books. If he just look at one of these books, he could understand what a rhinoceros looks like. Instead of struggling away blindly, thinking about what I mean, if you would just listen to what the other person was saying, everything would be so much clearer. So the, this is the first example of the kind of split and of taking of the world apart in a very immediate sense of, of a shift between a, oneself as subject being coherent and understanding that this coherence, not to say we aren't coherent, but understanding of the coherence is a construction. And that behind this clarity and certainty of who one is and what one's doing are a series of uncertainties either in conflict or not in conflict with each other, which one constructs into a possible sense, much as the different possible fragments of the lecture here get constructed into an appearance of coherence. One of the other things that happens in the studio and in the walking around the studio of necessity becomes a kind of trust in the material. Once the drawing has begun, there's a conversation between that which appears and that which one imagines appearing. That the drawing becomes a membrane between the world and yourself, both for the artist making it, where you have a sense of a rhinoceros outside in the world, and the sheet of paper on which there is some representation of it, and one's projection of what a rhinoceros is onto the drawing. This is done by the artist, but it's obviously done by everybody who is looking at the drawing also. You take a series of abstract shapes, what Kenneth Clark was talking about in the uh, painting by Velasquez, and there are a series of abstract oil paint marks, brush marks. And at a certain point, suddenly it turns into the edge of a cape or the lace around the collar of an infanta. And what is happening there is obviously not simply that the paint is a collar of an infantry. It's not. We can see clearly it's a series of white brush marks against an Antwerp blue cloth piece of paint behind it. But at a certain point, what happens is our projection of certain possible shapes, images, meets the drawing halfway. And the drawing becomes, or the painting becomes, this membrane between the world coming towards us and our projection of our ideas or images onto it. And this becomes patently clear in the example of Kenneth Clark or in all the things we do when we're looking at a drawing. So what the studio activity does is not invent a new idea about how we approach the world, but taking things that are invisible, which we know but we don't see, and making them palpable. Taking processes that we kind of take for granted and putting them on the center stage as the subject matter of what it is to be at work in the studio. To take the process, again, to hark back to the same idea, of the fragments of 
ideas and thoughts that get pushed into shape as a lecture and to make that disassembly the subject of the lecture itself. The circling of the studio, which I spoke about, has another echo and implication, and that has to do with the nature of repetition. Repetition in that this endless circling, circling like a zoetrope, in which the same action is endlessly reenacted as the zoetrope swings around, something that's in motion but in a sense static, that gets to the same place, that never gets to a new position. The zoetrope of action of walking around the studio has in it a kind of narrative push, as if in the next circuit of the studio an idea would emerge, as if the next time round the idea will be there that will enable the walking to stop and the drawing to begin. In terms of the lecture, it is echoed in the way in which I find in the old books. The same thing was written 12 times. The same notes were written down 12 times in the hope that in the 13th time of writing, there would suddenly be the connection that would enable the next set of ideas to emerge. And in the sphere of activity in the studio, there are many things which emerge as variations on a theme, the same image being painted again and again. Painting a coffee pot, and then repainting a coffee pot. These, in fact, these, uh, these particular coffee pots were a kind of productive procrastination to avoid writing the Norton Lectures for Harvard a year ago. At least it felt I was doing something, and then these turned into a series of lino cuts, and the lino cuts started having the, their own life themselves. But one of the things that emerged from this painting of these coffee pots endlessly, and there were 20 or 30 of them, and they got turned into a series of lino cuts, was what one hopes for, which is the emergence of a kind of secondary meaning, something that the material itself brings to bear that isn't there in the starting point of the images. And this, in a strange way, had to do with the good paintbrushes I was using with the fantastic Indian ink turning into bad brushes and what the bad brushes had to had to offer. So there are some brushes that hold their point very well, like the one I'm using over here, which can hold its shape, and you can do a fat line or a thin line, and it holds itself well. And I'll come later to talk about the nature of the books which are being defaced, which is a dangerous topic here, I know, in so many astonishing books. And this bad brush, you can see here the point, and I think it was a cheap brush and I mistreated it, but it doesn't keep a good point. It keeps flaking out into those many strands, which, not this fat brush here, it gives it many, many strands, and that, that in itself suggested a kind of featheriness that wasn't completely appropriate for the coffee pot, but which suggested a kind of a looseness and growth and multiplicity that turned into a series of trees. And so for the last while, and certainly in the period I've been working on this lecture, there's been a series of trees emerging in the studio, mostly to try to take uh, cognizance of what these brushes could do. Here's a coffee pot painted with uh, the good brush, and then after it was trying to do the same thing with the very broken up brush. Okay, so that's the broken up brush, which gives a very different kind of mark. So working with, these, with this bad brush and these different fragments, what I started doing was growing trees, allowing trees to start emerging from fragmentary sheets done on pages, which could gradually be collaged together to allow some kind of tree form to emerge. But here, I'm going to pause for a moment. This is where we start to get one of, to one of the real messy parts of the lecture, where the clarity of trying to pull the different pieces together stops. And it stops because I'm not sure which of several strands are the true ones, where the truth lies. 
there are three origins to the trees. And I'll talk briefly about the three origins as an example of a kind of constellation of ideas coming together to force one image together. And where again the clarity of a line seems to come from the overabundance of concurrent images or thoughts. Some, some months ago, I was speaking to some friends of ours in Cape Town, Basil and Adrian, and I asked Basil what Adrian was doing, who's a puppeteer. And he said, oh, uh, Adrian is busy making a tree search. And I thought, what is a tree search? And then even as I thought it, of course, a tree search is an internet term for tracking down some information. You put in the first piece of information and that's like the trunk and you can follow it up different branches and find subheadings of knowledge and uh, different pieces of information or go back down the trunk. This is a tree search. And at the end of the conversation, I said to Basil, okay, what was this research that Adrian was doing? And he said, what do you mean? I said, you said he was doing a tree search. And he said, no, I didn't. I said he was making a T-shirt. <laughs> so what was interesting was that I'd misheard the word, but in the moment of mishearing the word, had first cursed myself for stupidity and then invented this whole other world of research and diagrams and what it could be as if it completely existed. And this is interesting not for the idea of a tree search, which is not an intelligent idea, but as a demonstration of the need and the, ir the irrepressible need we have of making sense of the world, of taking incoherent fragments, this phrase tree search, and constructing a possible coherence out of it, taking two different phrases, as one would with a dream thought, and making this complicated dream out of it, in the same sort of speed one would make an image in a dream, in half a second. This whole etymology and history and examples of tree search is all there. That was the one origin of the trees, and in a way the trees that I was constructing became a kind of uh, demonstration of this tree search. But there's another completely different line of possible origins of, the, of these trees which are being drawn. And this again has to do with etymology. Um, between the ages of three and six, when I was between the ages of three and six, my father, who was a lawyer in South Africa, was working every day on what was known as the treason trial, a trial of 156 members of the African National Congress who were on trial for treason, including Nelson Mandela, between 1958 and 1961. In the end, they were finally uh, all released and, and acquitted. But to my four- or five-year-old head or three-year-old head, I always had the association much more domestically. At the bottom of our garden, there was a group of fir trees, and on our stoop, we had a mosaic table, which we used to talk about the tiles on the table. So for me, for all those years, my father went off every day to the trees and tile. <laughs> and my wife said to me, oh my God, you're still, you're still painting the damn trees and trials which are these trees made up out of different sheets of paper like different tiles that go together. So that's another possible origin of the, of the over-determination of the ideas of these, of these trees. And the third origin of the possible of these trees has to do with the nature of painting in, in books, of taking, in this case, I suppose appropriately, 19, copies of the 1953 edition of the uh, Shorter Oxford English Dictionary published here from, from Oxford, and constructing these trees and their texts um, on their pages. And the texts that emerged were both a mixture of phrases that I needed for this lecture and other phrases that were floating around the studio to be used at some later stage. Now, I'm not sure how far one can go in finding the parallels between dream work, the activity we do when we transform uh, ideas into a manifest dream, latent thoughts into a manifest Whether the ideas of condensation and displacement that one does in dreaming are the same as the processes that are done uh, in the studio, whether the different centering, 
the apparent emphasis in what is there in a dream and the real emphasis in the thoughts behind it, um, how closely one can follow this up. And certainly I'm not interested in the Freudian project of tracing these elements back to a primary trauma, to the amino acid of some primary trauma, which is what analysts do if they're dealing with, dealing with neurosis. What I am interested in showing the parallel of is that these processes are the fundamental kind of building blocks of how we do understand the world and force an understanding onto it. The kind of links and jumps and visual and verbal games, not that we can do, but that we can't stop ourselves from doing. The idea of word play, the idea of words as objects, objects in the trees either as tonal elements like lines or as objects in the trees as ideas associated with trees itself or as kind of metaphor. And again, it's not to try to track down the amino acid of the basic first trauma, but rather to acknowledge these processes and in a way to celebrate them and revel in those possibilities they then release into us. Now, on the beach when I was doing the first walk, and I, that's when the first time I thought, is, oh, this is, feels to me like I should be talking about dream work. And it was only much later when I was back off the beach that I thought, well, I'd better read the 300 pages in the interpretations of dreams on dream work, which I hadn't looked at for 20 years. Um, and found moments of coalescing. For example, I discovered that Freud talks a lot about the rebus as an idea. A rebus in which you take words and phrases and images and take the sound of an image like an I to mean the same as I and make those kinds of connections which allow for visual or linguistic absurdities but which can translate into a different kind of sense. And to think that those kinds of transformations become very important in how one allows things in the studio to happen, whether it is from a bad brush transforming itself into the idea of a tree, which is both a way of arriving at a series of drawings of trees, but also a way of trying to arrive at what is the strange relationship to my younger history and my father in the treason trial? What is the relationship of ideas sprouting from, from a tree? Without having to say, well, the fundamental reason is A or B, but allowing the multiplicity of reasons to, to flow along. And this rebus idea of different images is something that one also does in the studio where you have a series of concurrent images which are there in the studio. This was a section of the lecture about the amino acids of drawing, going back to Cezanne, to the sphere, the cone, and the cube, which he said were the building blocks of all images, and thinking, what do these suggest, where the sphere can become a globe, and the cone can become a megaphone, and the cube can become a cage, where you take these basic images and say, what are the associations that can spread out from them? What are the other ideas that then spread out onto these sheets of paper? Once one is saying, now what has arrived in the studio is the idea of multiplicity of pages to be reread, a kind of second-hand reading, a reinscribing of texts and books, to take the logical progression of them out, to allow a much more associative set of images to emerge. And I thought I needed then to make a kind of transformation to show how one image could transform to another. So this started as a series of drawings of turning a bird into a cage or a fruit bowl into a cone, um, or a woman into a typewriter. Different kind of vague associations, different things which one could see how they were done. As drawings, then I thought, well, maybe I should make them as cardboard sculptures. So they became cardboard sculptures. And at first they were just very simple drawings, thinking what happens if you change the order of a series of, of images. As if one's rewriting a narrative. What is the cause? Is A the cause of B? Does the tree get turned into the chair? Almost as if you're saying, here are a series of picture books and you can read them in different ways to a child in very different, different ways.
And from, after this, they changed from these drawings into pieces of cardboard cut out, and from the cardboard cut out into three-dimensional objects, like these in which the sculptures themselves would turn and transform from the fruit bowl to the cone, from the megaphone to a square. And in a way, this was like the longest piece of procrastination. This was a vague idea on the beach walk that turned into these paper drawings, into the cardboard sculptures, into a foundry working to turn these into bronze casts. And this, in fact, I thought, oh, I've been working on this lecture for months. And I realized, no, I'd been making these sculptures for months, avoiding working on what the text of the lecture would have to be. As if it's a kind of hieroglyph in which there's an invitation to the viewer to make a possible sense or nonsense, or to take simply the possibility of sense as what it is that they offer rather than an actual interpretation. And there was a final shift from, or back, backward step from these sculptures. And that was taking all the sheets of paper which had been accumulating during this time of phrases, of images that were being used for sculpture, and saying, right, let them go back into a book. And the book, like the tree, gets kind of overdetermined. There are multiplicity, there's a surplus of reasons for the book to reemerge. Firstly, it has to do with the kind of paper or the kind of text. So certain books call to be drawn on by the way in which they absorb charcoal. There's some in which are very shiny paper in which you can brush a charcoal mark off very easily. There are certain books which aren't well sized, so the, they absorb Indian ink like blotting paper. And there are other sheets which hold the ink very beautifully and keep their flatness, like these pages of the Oxford Dictionary. There's a possibility of multiplicity, that you buy one volume and there are 970 or 1,270 pages waiting to be drawn. And you think of what it is in a dictionary that has to do with abundance, abundance of words. So many words one will never want, but one is so happy to have the three kilograms of weight in one's hand. Um, there's a kind of animation in it, the way in which there are those thousands of frames of film there in a book waiting to be turned, a kind of flip book done on a larger scale. There's the narrative pressure of a book, the sense that it has a cover at the front and a cover at the back, and you open it and you get through and you get to the end. So unlike an ordinary ream of paper or a roll of drawing paper or a drawer full of drawing paper, it has the idea of narrative um, built into it. There's a kind of memory one can always describe one's bookshelves as a kind of materialized self-portrait. One of the ways you can describe yourself is by the shelves of books that sit in your house. And one of the things that makes me anxious about Kindles is the dematerialization of the self. Not that one's going to reread all the books in one's shelf, but if they disappear, there's a sense of who would I be? There's the materialization of that which is invisible, which is to say taking all these vague thoughts and phrases and they get put onto these sheets of paper and the vague thoughts turn into 2.3 kilograms of paper. So these, all these multiplicity of ideas that push for these sheets of paper to go back into the book. I mean, there's the whole complicated status of the nature of of books like this, particularly a book like the Oxford English Dictionary from 1953, which is not a rarity. No one is going to, the world is not going to be deprived if 10 volumes of it disappear from the thousands that are there. It's not a book that most people would need now. People, if they were using a real dictionary, would go to the larger one. If it was the kind of things in that, they'd look it up online. We used to have a battle in our house between my wife and myself on one hand and the children on the other when a word had to be found when we would run off to the library and they would go to their computers. But then internet speeds got faster in South Africa. And in truth, we all now just look it up on our phones. So there's a way in which that particular kind of book, of which one finds every second-hand bookstore book loaded down, become a treasure trove of raw material. And 
let it be said, let me reassure people who are the, the guardians of wonderful rare books here at Oxford that there are no really old or valuable books that I have chosen to draw on. It's not about an, an iconoclasm. It's about a rereading, a reusing of these, the implicit thought inside those. So in the end, after having gone through notes and notebooks, drawings and sculpture, what emerged at the end of the process, and in fact is the ongoing part of this lecture, which continues past it to be finished in the next months, is the start of a kind of flipbook, which is both about a narrative that starts at the beginning and will eventually get to the end, but which acknowledges repetition, inconsistency, illogicality as part of its material. So I'm going to finish by showing a fragment of a work in process. And I'm not certain whether the book that I'm showing and whether the lecture that I'm giving now is simply a prelude to get to this book which is finally being made, or whether in fact the two together constitute the actual work. It's nice, but it's not an essential part of it. In fact, there are two very different soundtracks. There's one with this very gentle Schubert, and there's another with a piece of Shostakovich and their many others.